All right, we're off and running. New book this week. Which, what are we in this week? Who read the lesson? Moses. <laughs> Moses wrote it. <laughs> All right, background. Book of Exodus. Exodus means departure. So who was departing? Israelites. The Israelites, the nation of Israel, right? And they're departing from? Egypt. Egypt. How'd they get there? Food that yeah, was a famine, right? Right. They went to Egypt because somebody was already there and was able to protect them. Joseph. Right. Right. Joseph had been sold into slavery, and then God had promoted him to second only to Pharaoh <laughs> in Egypt. And so... Long story short, he ends up bringing a whole family, you know, a number of 70 people total went from the promised land, as we'll later call it, right, to Egypt. Jacob, Israel, and his sons and their sons, etc. 70 people plus Joseph now in, his, in Egypt. And a while later, it tells us after it gives us the names of everybody who was there in the beginning, we get into, in verse 8, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. <laughs> right? And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. There's a bunch of these people now. And what if we get in a war and they decide to join the enemy? <laughs> We'd be in big trouble. So he decides he better get them under control and he enslaves them, right? And treats them pretty rough. And how long are they in Egypt total? 400 years. 400 years, right? There is a debate about that number. Some people say there were, there were 215 years in the Promised Land and then 215 years in in Egypt for a total of the 430, but I don't know which one is correct for sure, but the Bible pretty clearly says that the, this whole time frame is for over 400 years. So, But there has to be enough time for them to expand from 70 people to a total of somewhere north of 2 million, 608,000 men over the age of 20. <laughs> Guns. That's a bunch of people. Now you could see why, if they're growing like that, that the pharaoh might get nervous, <laughs> right? Now if he treated them right, maybe they would have been a good ally, <laughs> right? Now where in Egypt were they? Somewhere close to a burning bush. <laughs> 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 no, that was. <laughs> well, well, the Erie Canal hadn't been put in yet. If you look at this map here, it's in the northern part of Egypt, you see all this nice fertile land along the Nile. And this area up here, right, is called Goshen, and that's where they were. So they had some of the best land in Egypt to live on. <laughs> the burning bush was. We're going to get to that. Indian? In Midian. And where is it located? I'm going to show you. Okay. Because I'm going to Don't tell you that what everybody else tells you is wrong. <laughs> and why. Right? But yeah, so they're in a good place. They're in a fertile place. So they're growing crops and they're raising their animals and they're just having a gay old time and they're populating like crazy, multiplying as the Bible says. Right? And the... Uh, the Egyptians start getting nervous, and so they say, we're going to have to put the pressure on them, and they do, and they multiplied even more, which reminds me of in Christianity, right? Christianity grows faster when we're persecuted <laughs> than it does when we're not, <laughs> which, you know, on the surface doesn't make a lot of sense, but... <laughs> 
Well, our population would go up if they turn the TV off. <laughs> Television is an interesting <laughs> subject, isn't it? It's kind of like the internet. A lot of bad and a little good. <laughs> right? Okay, so now they're in Egypt. They're being oppressed. Now they're becoming even slaves, right? And they're being really oppressed. But along comes this little beautiful baby boy <laughs> we know as Moses. And his mother decides that she's not going to kill him like they're saying, you got to kill all the baby boys, right? And so she puts him in a basket and sets him in the Nile River in the reeds, you know, near where the princess of Egypt hangs out. And her sister watches over him. When you look at this whole story of Moses, you just got to step back and say, golly, what a God thing. <laughs> Here's a baby that the Egyptians are trying to kill. She puts him in a basket in the river, right? None of the animals, the alligators or anybody get him, right? But the prince, princess of Egypt finds him, right, and adopts him, and then hires his real mother <laughs> to nurse him. You know her name? <laughs> the name of the mother? Jacuba. Huh? Jacuba was Moses' real mother. That's her mother. That's correct. Right? You know? So you look at this whole story of how Moses ends up in the palace. How long is he raised in the palace? How long does he live in the palace? Forty years. He's 40 years old when... He decides that he doesn't like the way the Egyptians are treating the Israelites, and he sees an Egyptian brutalizing an Israelite, and he kills him. <laughs> okay? Now, this seems kind of funny to me, because if you're a prince of Egypt, you probably have perfect authority to kill people. <laughs> You know, I would think. But for some reason, this is a big deal. And when he realizes the next day that it was not a secret, <laughs> that apparently the guy who had been brutalized is now telling everybody that Moses had killed this Egyptian, right? And the word spread and right now. So now, <clears throat> apparently, the powers to be are after Moses, maybe because they realized that he actually was an Israelite himself, right? You know, because I don't think that was a big secret. And his mother had taught him about being a Jew, right, an Israelite. And that may have continued on after, even after the nursing, because, you know, the nursing's done by the time he's three years old, right? So he wouldn't remember a whole lot if she didn't keep on teaching him, you know. So apparently he maintained a relationship because he knew all about what it meant to be an Israelite. Then, apparently... This is not in the Bible, but Moses was commander of the Egyptian army that fought wars in the south. So he understood military operations. Then he gets into this ordeal, and he flees, and he goes where? Now, you see this map here? Here's Egypt. Here's the Arabian Peninsula. Here's Midian <clears throat> over here. That's a lot of miles, isn't it? <laughs> well, he wanted to get some distance. <laughs> so he goes all the way to Midian. And who does he meet in Midian? His future father. His, <laughs> Jethro, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he marries Zephora, right? Over here in Midian. And how long is he in the wilderness of Midian over here, in the arid area? Forty years. Forty years. <laughs> Forty nights. <nine, so. laughs> right? So he's 40 years over here being prepared as a military commander, <laughs> right? He's 40 years over here learning how to tend sheep and survive in the wilderness, right? And then has a wife, he has a couple of sons, right? 
Then we get to chapter 3. It says, Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Where is he? Midian, Midian. right? And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So he's at the west side of of Midian, their wilderness, and and finds the mountain of God, Horeb. If you go there today, into the area of Midian, the people there call it the mountain of Moses. Today, even today. Okay? And where is it? It's in Midian. Where's Midian? (laughs) Way over here. (laughs) Right? So this red line that says the Israelites traveled down here to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb is incorrect. It's in Midian. Right? Is that in modern day Iraq? Who would that be? No, this is the uh, Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia controlled land. Yeah. For the most part. Right? Yeah, but Midian's way over here, right? So, you have this <laughs> this guy over there tending his flock in, in there, and he find, but goes by the, the mountain of God, right? Which probably at this point was not really called the mountain of God, but it's about to be, <laughs> okay? And who is there? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. Now who's in the burning bush? The angel of the Lord. What do we know about the, not an angel, the angel of the Lord? There's about, there's close to ten different times in the Old Testament that the angel of the Lord appears. And every time, next thing you know, he's being called God. So, a lot of us think this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ himself. The angel of the Lord. So he's in this burning bush. Moses looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So what kind of fire was this? (laughs) It's burning, but the bush isn't burning. Mm-hmm. Right? Moses is like, whoo, this is weird. I got to check this out, right? So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord, the Lord, okay, in the, when it says the Lord, what's the actual Hebrew word? Yahweh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? The Lord saw that he turned aside. Right? So God was sitting there waiting for him to turn aside. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Now, first off, I'm pretty amazed the bush is burning and not being consumed. Now the bush is talking to me. (laughs) This has got to kind of freak you out a little bit. (laughs) It's not an everyday experience, is it? (laughs) <laughs> Am I away? <laughs> right? You know. <laughs> and he said, Here I am, which is a Hebrew for yes. <laughs> you know, here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Why is it holy ground? Because the angel of the Lord is there. Yeah, God is there. That makes it holy, <laughs> right? Because God is holy. So now it's holy ground. He's standing on holy ground. God says, take your sandals off. I guess his sandals were dirtier than his feet. <laughs> I don't imagine his feet were all that clean either. But <laughs> right? So you're standing on holy ground. And he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. (laughs) I probably would be too. (laughs) 
You know, we see all these examples that an angel shows up and people fall face down on their face. Can you imagine if God was to appear? You know, we couldn't dig a hole fast enough. <laughs> Especially when you realize how holy he is and what kind of a sinner we are, right? You know, oh my gosh. <laughs> right? But you notice he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. These people are still in existence. Yes, their bodies, they lived and they died, but they're still there. They're in heaven with God, right? That's the implication of this. He's telling them who he is, and they're, they're still alive, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> God, referred to as the angel of the Lord, appears to Moses. Then we have this rather interesting conversation. Have you ever felt like God wanted you to do something and you didn't feel like you wanted to do it? Mm -hmm. How many times when you were younger or whatever and the Lord said, come on down and get saved, and you're like, well, I think I need to do that, but I don't think I want to do it today. (laughs) The Spirit convicting you to go forward and you're like, (laughs) you start thinking of something else real quick. You know? Yeah, change the subject, right? <laughs> you know, and this we have this going on here. The Lord says, "I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them. That means suddenly snatch. <laughs> Reminded me of the rapture when he says, you know." And when you get down to it, after the tenth plague, it was a sudden snatch. The, you get the first nine plagues, old Pharaoh's being stubborn, but boy, after the tenth one, he wasn't stubborn anymore. Right? He's going to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, etc. Right? So he's telling Moses what he's going to do. Okay. He's heard all about, he's heard their cries, right? Verse 9, And behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Why does God choose to use us when he wants to do something? Why does he pick ordinary people? This guy's a shepherd out in the wilderness. Been there 40 years, shepherding, you know, shepherding mm-hmm. sheep. Because if he picked a higher up, you would expect him to do that. But you know, he, picked, he picked this person. He to pay him back. Well, he picked David, right? <laughs> the youngest in the family is a shepherd, Yeah. right? I mean, why does he pick us at all? So it's his power, not your power. You know? I have no idea. Isn't it interesting that he does, that he wants to use us? If he wants something done right, why doesn't he do it himself? (laughs) He knows we ain't going to do it right. We're going to mess it up, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know? But he, he always chooses to use us, to involve us, in his work. I don't know if this is to prepare us for the future where he's going to use us to do his work in heaven and whatever else we're going to do, you know, or... Well, it's a ticket to the guilt train. Or if it... Don said that he uses people that everybody that knows them would know that they can't do that. (laughs) And yet they are. So it's God doing it. Well, see, that's, you know, it, it, it's always God doing it, sure. he, but he does it through people, and again, ordinary individuals for the most part. Very rarely is somebody, somebody you know, that's already renowned, you know, and God picks them. That's unusual. I remember this guy, I used to watch this guy on Sunday night, Ernest Ainsley. Anybody ever seen Ernest Ainsley's preach? Yeah. I mean, if you ever heard him preach, you'd swear he was queer as a $3 bill. I mean, he is, and yet I've never heard him say anything that wasn't absolutely biblical, you know. And God using him to preach. 
God picks out ordinary, so when, if he picks us to do something, we shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> We're not good enough to be excluded. <laughs> <laughs> right? He yanks people out of prisons. You know, Joseph was the youngest at the time, right? I mean, and Benjamin comes along. But he chose him to perform a purpose to take care and to move everybody into Egypt where they would grow in numbers. Now they're ready to take the promised land. Well, look at you Samson. He, he wasn't his mama's boy or anything. He, he wasn't a... <laughs> yeah. He's well, absolutely. Kind of a character, but... Well, the people he chose, and, and if you look at Joseph and Mary, the earthly parents of Jesus, just regular folk, right? You know, he does that all the time. Now he's picking Moses, who he's been preparing for 80 years, unknowns to Moses. <laughs> you know, from the time he was a baby boy, God had his hand on him, right, and preparing him to do what he was going to do now. So <clears throat> what has God been preparing us to do that we still have to accomplish? Is there something that God's asking us to do that we're not doing? He's been preparing us. If you look at your skill sets that you've developed over the years, how can they be applied? You know. Well, my skill sets are diminishing <laughs> at a rapid rate. Well, I understand that. You know, when you turn 80, you, know, you got to expect things not to be as well as they were at 40. <laughs> you know. But on the other hand, Moses is 80. Yeah. And he's going to spend the next 40 years and not lose anything. God's going to miraculously empower his people to maintain their strength. Remember when they're in the wilderness, their clothes don't wear out, their sandals don't wear out. <laughs> you know, they don't seem to get any older, you know, uh, physically. Obviously, chronologically they are. Um, but that's, again, it's a God thing. And God may have something for us to do, even past 80, that we hadn't even thought about. We better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of time, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, God picks Moses, and Moses is like, well, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? First excuse, who am I? Now, we know later on that Moses is considered the most humble guy. At this point, I don't know if it's humility or just excuses because he's going to have a series of them, right? Mm -hmm. Why he can't do it. And maybe it's insecurity. Maybe he realized he had, he had risen to such a position in the palace and then blew it, so to speak, right? And now he's been in the wilderness tending sheep for 40 years. He doesn't consider himself to be of any real value. At least, you know, to God, right? That God could do something for me. He's obviously helping Jethro. He's taking care of his sheep. <laughs> you notice it didn't say it was his sheep. It's Jethro's sheep. Who am I? And God said, certainly I will be with you. Because <laughs> who's actually going to do it? God. Not Moses. It's just like we talk about witnessing, right? We don't have the power to save people or forgive them of sins, right? We just tell them about the love of Jesus. What happens next between them and the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to do with that. It's all a God thing. Moses just to go there to tell Pharaoh, hey, it's time to let everybody go. <laughs> That's his job. He always got to say, it's time to let everybody go. <laughs> and what happens next between Pharaoh and God? Because God's the one that's going to release them. And he's going to tell him what he's going to do, too, right? Moses is behold, going to the sons of Israel in verse 13, I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. Now they may say to me, what is his name? Now, <clears throat> to the Israelites, right, the whole tribe starts with Abraham, right? So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Has there been a name for God that they've been known by? 
this sounds like, again, that, you know, what if they say, what's his name? Like they would know his name. <laughs> you know, it's not like they're going to validate anything. You know, he just used another excuse, but God uses this to give us some very critical information that is used now through the rest of history. You know, and Jesus uses this, you know, the, the, Jesus spoke the I am's, right? I am the bread of life, right? You know, you see Jesus using the I am phrase, which drove the Pharisees absolutely berserk because they know what I am meant, <laughs> right? Because right here he says, God said to Moses, I am who I am, Yahweh, right? Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And I am, see, it just means I am self-existent. <laughs> I've always been here. I'll always be here. I don't need anything else for survival, right? I'm completely self-sustaining, right? I'm unchangeable, you know. And by the way, faithful to his promises. <laughs> I am. This is me. It's what it's a done deal, right? <clears throat> and he and thus you shall say that the Lord, you know, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So now he's given them a name to go by. And they and they honored it so that they never actually spelled it. Remember, it's always abbreviated. So we're guessing at how it might be spelled with Yahweh, Y-A-W-E-H. Nobody knows because it's never actually written out, okay? And <clears throat> so he tells them to gather all the elders of Israel. And, and uh, verse 18 says, They will pay heed to what you say. And you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt. We'll say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now, please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And Moses, right? He says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it, and after that he will let you go, and I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. You know, they got 400 years of wages to get paid for. They're way, the Egyptians are way behind on their payments, right? And every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing and, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Right? And Moses, in his extreme self-confidence, says, but what if they don't believe me? Mm-hmm. Now, who's That's the one? That's a reasonable question. <laughs> That's not all the all. I think it is, because he's already told him, I'm the one doing this, not you. I'm doing this. I'm just sending you. You're my voice. That's it. I'm doing this. And this is what's going to happen. But Moses just looking for all the excuses. And, you're, and when we get to the end of it, we realize it's just excuses, right? You know. And he says, take your staff and throw it down. And it becomes a snake. Then he tells him to grab it by the tail. And you pick up a snake, you grab it by the tail. No, it'll bite you. You grab it right behind the head where it can't bite you, right? He says, grab it by the tail. Moses did. Became a staff again, right? So that's one of the things he's going to show the Israelites to show that he has been sent by God. The staff will turn into a snake and then back into the staff. Now what happens at the first, (laughs) when he first meets Pharaoh? Do anybody remember that? He throws down the staff in front of Pharaoh and it becomes a snake. And Pharaoh's magicians turn their staffs into snakes. And then Moses' snake eats theirs. (laughs) 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 And then he picks up by the tail and becomes a staff again with a full belly. (laughs) All right? Anyway, so he's telling him what's going to happen here that that they might believe. <clears throat> right? Then he tells him to put his hand into his bosom and pull it out and it's leprous. 
Then he puts it back in, pulls it out, and it's all clean again. Okay? <clears throat> then he gets down here in verse 10. He said, Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I'm not an eloquent speaker. I can't make speeches. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so what excuses do we offer to God? I don't have time mm -hmm. to do that for you. I don't have the money to do that. Right? But if God wants you to do it, isn't he going to supply what you need? And that's shown because it looked at many people that had things wrong with them that he used, you know. Yeah, again, like I say, he picks just ordinary people with yeah. all their faults and performs his miraculous works, right? I guess I was too perfect. He never did <laughs> Yeah, you were too good. <laughs> you were too good to be called, right? You know, in verse 12, he says, Now go, I. Even I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. What did Jesus tell the disciples, right? On the night of the crucifixion, he tells them, you know, you're going to go and you're going to stand before kings and don't worry about what you say. I'll show you what you'll be able to speak. The Holy Spirit will empower you to speak what you're supposed to say at that time. And all these things I've taught you will be brought to your remembrance. <laughs> Because again, it's God doing it. We're just the mouthpiece. We don't have to be smart or anything like that, right? We don't have to be eloquent. We just have to be obedient. And God will do everything else. Okay? <laughs> Moses still making excuses. And the anger of the Lord in verse 14 burned against Moses. And he said, Is there not your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. And you are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Now, <clears throat> it appears, when we get on in the story, that Moses ends up doing the speaking anyway, even though he's got Aaron with him, <laughs> right? You know? God teaches them what to say, just like he does with us. And Moses departed, returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Right? So Moses, in verse 20, took his wife, his sons, and mounted on a donkey, and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Right? So now he's headed back, goes back to Egypt, right? And <clears throat> he tells him that he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. In verse 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. <laughs> right? So... First in his heart, so to speak. This is, this is my priority, is Israel. And you better pay attention. But, of course, he didn't. He said, so I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you have sent, but you have refused to let him go, behold, I will kill your son. Your firstborn. So when we get to the tenth plague, the death angel takes out the firstborn male. It's not a surprise. God's already told Moses this is what's going to happen way back here. And that's like ten months later by the time we get to the tenth plague, right? You know. Then he has to circumcise his sons and his wife gets all mad. <laughs> And the Lord told Aaron to go meet Moses, which he did. Okay. <clears throat> and then in verse 29, And Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. 
And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. Right? And what were the signs? The staff becomes a snake. Hand in your bosom and come out with leprosy. Leprosy. And then back in and clean again, right? So in 31, so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshipped. So Moses was worried about nothing. The people were saying you have to prove it to them. <laughs> you know, no, well, we do that, don't we? God says, I want you to do this. And you're like, oh, but what about this? And what about that? And what if I don't do this right? And what if you know that happens? Or what if they say this? Or if he says, go knock on this door. And you're like, well, what if they slam the door in my face? <laughs> <laughs> what does that have to do with anything, right? It yeah, might happen. Yeah, it's pretty happens. rare, but, you know. Thing, things, uh, God doesn't tell us that everything's going to be good. He just tells us what's going to happen in the end. Back to the Romans 8.28, you know, all things work together to the good. So Moses is called. He argues about it for a while, but he finally gives in. And we know that he becomes, quote, the most humble man on earth, you know, realizing that he, a nobody, is being used by God to do a great thing. I don't know if he realized how big a deal it really was, but he knew it was a big deal, but I don't know if he realized how big a deal it really was, you know. And certainly he didn't realize all the implications as foreshadowing the coming of Jesus Christ that are in this whole episode. Right? Well, I don't think he knew the extent of it. No, I don't think so either. He just knew it was, I mean, he was doing a big he thing. Didn't have you know, the background to understand it. But he had communication with God. <laughs> so God showed him a lot of different things, you know, that was going to happen, including the death of the firstborn, right? All right. Any questions or comments about our intro to Exodus? We had to jump through four chapters so fast. <laughs> okay. Well, Heavenly Father, 